Hello, everyone. It's Matt here. Welcome to episode two of the Mind Blown Zone. Title of this episode is Blind Trust in Authority. How are you, Brad? Fantastic. Never better yourself. Uh, also, never better. The best way to be. Absolutely. <laughs> so we're talking about a fairly significant problem that we identify in society, this blind trust in authority. But we want to let you know as a preface that we're not just here to complain and talk about how bad people are or judge people for having blind trust and authority. It's not just to rag on problems and rile up uh, anger about how bad things are or anything like that. We want to let you know that we're here with solutions. We want to talk about this particular concept objectively uh, and just bring awareness to what it is and the causes that go with it. And then we want to present, you know, what are the, what are some solutions here? Okay. So we think that you really love those solutions. They're going to bring a lot of value into your life and, you know, just it bring some immediate uh, relieving perspectives into your life to, you know, to see a happier path forward. So I'm going to kick it over to Brad right now, and he's going to tell us about blind trust in authority. Fantastic. Thanks, Matt. So yeah, just to, so everybody knows, I sort of forced Matt to uh, make this our second podcast, uh, just because it's been uh, this idea of blind trust and authority has been something I've come around to in the last two or three years, you know, especially around certainly the COVID situation. Uh, for years and years and years, if you caught me, you know, five, ten years ago, I would say, ah, if we just end the Fed or we just, you know, fix the media or fix the the government or whatever, then everything would be fine. Uh, but I've since upgraded my thoughts to this blind trust and authority idea. And I think it's the essential problem that affects humanity. And we'll talk in great detail later in this podcast about why we think that is. Uh, but, you know, first of all, what I, you know, the first thing I want to point out is that everybody agrees it's not a good idea to blindly trust authority. No, nobody disagrees with this idea. Uh, and so it's kind of perceived as a cliche, right? Everybody agrees with that. Uh, but the problem arises when we agree with it in principle, but not in practice. And it really becomes this idea that it's really a, becomes a platitude. I'm going to kick it over to Matt here for the tight definition of what a platitude is, because most of us kind of know what it is, but maybe not precisely. So Matt, what was that definition that we had? Oh yeah, we got a super new tight definition here. You know, when I was young, you know, I loved this word platitude. I was like, oh yeah, that's like when you say something and it's just one of those typical common sayings that doesn't really have much meaning. Right. And I don't, I don't know about uh, everyone else listening, but yeah, it seems like people generally think that that's what it is, but we looked it up and there's actually a lot more to it. All right. So let's listen to this. Okay. We, we got this off Wikipedia. Okay. A platitude is a trite, meaningless or prosaic statement. Okay, fine. But then it goes on often used as a thought terminating cliche aimed at quelling social emotional or cognitive unease. Okay, I'm just going to read that second part again. Used as a thought terminating cliche aimed at quelling social, emotional, or cognitive unease. And, you know, you have to then ask, well, okay, well, if it's quelling some sort of unease, well, what specific unease would that be? And we, we kind of talked about that. And I thought, it seems like the unease is that we do blindly trust in authority. And that's kind of like this uh, under the surface lingering fact that uh, we don't want to want to look at, right? So we kind of like, uh, you know, elbow each other and nudge each other and go, don't, uh, don't believe uh, blindly on authority, huh? right? <laughs> right, guys? Yeah. <laughs> and we just say it and then we can like pretend to ourselves that we don't blindly trust in authority. But I think the fact of the matter is that we do blindly trust in authority in a lot of areas, and that is definitely causing us a lot of problems. So, do you want to go further into it, Brad? Yeah, I, I just that's that that's the core 
situation that we face, I think we talked about this earlier too, that we're just, we're, we're like naturally wired to be trusting. And this has been, I think, taken advantage of uh, by a certain group. And it puts us in a position, it puts us in a position where we lose our power. We're giving it away when we agree with the authority. We're saying, well, you're the one who studied all this and learned all this. So I'm going to have to trust you that you're right. And to be clear, well, I'll probably make this statement several times throughout the podcast. We're not criticizing the uh, authorities so much because they also blindly trusted authority in their lifetimes and their educations and their learning. And so it's not the not, not necessarily the the people that we trust uh, in authoritative positions that are deliberately tricking us. It's that they have also been tricked. So, as I think I mentioned earlier, you know, um, oh, where was I going with that, Matt? What was that next bullet? The uh, agreeing in principle gives us a false sense of independent intellectual integrity. That's oh, that comes from the, the bullet above. So we consciously agree with this idea that we should not blindly trust authority, but that we unconsciously disagree in practice because of that cognitive unease. Or perhaps it could also be we just don't feel we can learn this subject that we're blindly believing in, or we don't have the intellectual capacity to understand the complexities of it. There's something that stops us from looking into or checking to make sure the authorities have it right. Is that making a little bit of sense? Oh, yeah. And I mean, you, there's I'm an infinite depth in thinking about what the reasons are here, but like a, a lot of the um, a lot of the things we believe were determined as settled science like hundreds of years before we even were born, right? So we born we've been born into a world that already has particular things in in science, in law, in government as like the truth, right? And the 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 depth that you have to go to. The, and the research that you have to go to to find out where are the kind of assumptions in here that might not necessarily be true upon which the conclusions rest is very deep, extremely, extremely deep. Right. And, you know, all, all of the, uh, you know, one of the, the symptoms of, you know, just how we've all lived for centuries or even millennia is that, you know, we've ended up like really busy, right? We barely have enough time for anything. And we literally don't even have maybe enough time in some people's like lifetimes to even go in and investigate all of this stuff. So what are you going to do? You know, so you just, you just assume, well, I, I, I guess, I mean, I hope, I hope all that stuff's true. I guess it is. Everyone seems to think it's true, you know? So we, we end up in a place whether we're too busy or it's just too complicated or whether we lack the courage to go and check whether things that we believed are true or not. And we end up in a place where we just have blindly trust our place in authority. And it's a thing that we need to get out of. It's like uh, when Batman is in that big deep hole and he has to climb out of the hole, like you got to really put in all your effort to get out of this. It's a serious matter. Yeah, hundred percent. Right. Exactly. And it's uh, you know, something I didn't, didn't state here on, on paper, but, we're of the firm belief that none of these things we're going to talk about future podcasts and you know, these areas we'll dive into deeper. None of it's complicated, what we're going to point out. None of it's beyond the intellectual capacity of, of your everyday average person. It does not require a genius level intellect or anything to understand these things. Matt said the magic words earlier, which was there are these assumptions that are embedded in these collective axioms that we all say, oh, of course that's true. Of course this is true. And as it turns out, these things, a lot of things that we'll reveal are not true. And it's because there is an assumption built into this axiomatic truth we all agree upon. So again, we'll, we'll dive deeply into it, but I, I like to call this, it's sort of like a magical spell. Uh, this, you know, repeat a, a lie often enough and it becomes the truth. It's kind of what we're up against and m many of the things that we'll be pointing out in future broadcasts. So it's, it, it's, it's kind of like brainwashing is what it turns out to be.
Um, and I guess lastly, you know, we're we're hoping to bring this idea of land trust and authority today out of the territory of a platitude. We want you to see the power of questioning things and where it can get you really fast when you take the time to investigate or research something that's important to your life or your family's life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, we want to get everyone away for just to, just to make that concrete is we want to get people away from saying, ha ha, don't trust blindly an authority, huh? But then just going straight back to blindly trusting authority. We want to get it to the point where everyone is like, we need to make absolutely sure that we're not blindly trusting our own authority. And whenever we hear someone express some uh, point of view that uh, suggests blind trust and authority, that we pull them up immediately say, no, this is not accepted anymore. This is blind trust and authority. And let's get to the truth here. 100%. Uh, so we're going to go into uh, some examples here of high authority people where we place our trust, right? Now we want to we want to lead off with a special example of someone who you kind of do need to place your trust <laughs> in, right? Because right. there's a lot where you shouldn't, but there is somewhere you kind of should. So we need to like, you know, make make this contrast clear. So do you want to lead off with your nice mechanic example, yeah. Fred? Well, yeah, I, I want to throw something out just ahead of that too. And it, none of this, none of this podcast is about like not trusting you know, people that keep in the peace, the law enforcement, the police officer. I mean, right? We're not talking about defying, you know, authority that keeps us living in a civilized society at all. That's not what this podcast is about. Uh, but one of the examples I picked, you know, I, I pick mechanic, but you could pick, you know, you know, a carpenter, or a plumber, an electrician, you know, a thousand different people that, who have developed an expertise in a particular area. So we're not, it's really not what this is about. So I pick mechanic just, you know, the example was, you know, you, your car breaks down, you don't know how to fix your car and, but the mechanic does know how to fix the car right there. So they're kind of a, you know, a tangible expert, right? Because obviously the, the if the mechanic charges you, whatever they're going to charge you, uh, they got to give you back your car in working order. So you have to trust the mechanic. Now, you know, perhaps the mechanic gives you a, a quote, say for a thousand dollars to fix your car. And he tells you, you know, this, that, or the other's wrong with it. And you think, well, that's pretty high. So maybe I'll get that car towed to another mechanic and see if I can get a lower quote. So there is some, there's where you, uh, an example of where you just don't blindly trust what the mechanic has said, unless you, you know, obviously have a long standing experience with them. But this is just an example where you're going to have to eventually trust a mechanic if you want your car back. You're not going to have the time to learn how to fix your car. <laughs> you probably need it to go to work the next day and so forth. So this is just an example. We're not saying question, you know, the every single thing, uh, you know, down to the nth degree. But there are some more critical uh, areas where we're suggesting that questioning authorities on certain topics may, in fact, be beneficial to you in liberating you from some lies, and uh, you know, that lead to greater sense of freedom, taking your power back, uh, you know, better health, better asset protection, on and on and on. So this is just the idea that we wanted to make sure we aren't saying question every single authority in your life. Is mm -hmm. that making a little bit of sense? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's pretty clear. I guess now we can lead into some authorities where we think you should uh, be questioning seriously. I uh, want, want to lead it off with one where you probably already kind of agree with us, right? Just to just to soften the blow here. Uh, and that would be politicians. Right? <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, probably, uh, you know, <laughs> even the collective consciousness achieved a title of among the least trustworthy people in society at this point, uh, simply because, you know, they, they come along and make campaign promises and say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. You know, give me your vote so that I get in this powerful position and get a big salary. And then you, I mean, no sooner than they're in office and you, you know, you voted for them and then you just find out, oh, so you're not going to do what, what you said you're going to do, right? Might take a while. They might be like, oh yeah, we're getting around to that. We're getting around to that. We're just, you know, we're going to do a few things. The opposition has made it very difficult, but we're totally getting around to that. And then it gets to the end of their term and you're kind of like, wait a tick. Your turn's over and you didn't even do it. And I think we've had enough of those experiences where we're like, 
you know what? I'm not going to blindly trust an authority. However, we're not at the point yet where it's fully understood yet because the next politician, like what, there's going to be another um, US uh, election soon and it's going to come around and politicians are going to make promises. And we all know that people are going to believe that those promises actually are actually going to come to fruition. No matter how much experience we've had, we're still going to trust them and believe that what they're saying is true. And so there's just definitely work to be done. But that's politicians. Is there anything you want to add into politicians before we go on to more health areas, Brent? No, I think that uh, that pretty well sums it up. I've got more opinions that we'll, we can certainly get into in depth at a later time. Okay, well, um, let's uh, go into heavier territory then. Yeah, so and I'm going to restate an issue I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> excuse me, which is that, you know, in the healthcare space, we have, you know, our authorities in the healthcare space have also succumbed to line trust and authority, right? which was their education and training that may or may not have all been accurate. And I think we have no more glaring example today than obviously the COVID situation where, you know, a significant portion of the population has already come to realize that, uh, you know, the mask idea, there's never, there's zero science that ever supported that. I mean, we, some of us knew that from the very beginning. Uh, and the same thing with social distancing. I mean, no one can prove or disprove that idea, but I, I think it's fair to say that, you know, this idea of not visiting, you know, a relative in a, in a hospital or not hugging your loved ones and all of these were, were really, really harmful ideas, and, you know, that, which will be seen more and more by the public as time goes on. You know, the lockdowns, the business closures, all of these ideas didn't really change much. Uh, for anybody that looks into this in, in any degree of depth, they'll see that this idea that we had a pandemic of epic proportions was anything but, uh, you know, looking at the data for it. And obviously, you know, the, the most divisive idea was the jab, um, you know, the changing of the definition of, of vaccination in 2020 so that we would accept that word, that safe and effective vaccination word. But, you know, as time went on, right, it started with this, this will protect you and your loved ones. And then this won't necessarily, can't only protect a certain percentage and then it won't protect you, but it lessens the, the, uh, you know, the symptoms and on and on and on it little by little, as our authorities told us these things, right. The presentation changed. And we're obviously at a point now when a significant portion of the population has woken up to the fact that these these jabs caused a lot of harm and the benefit of them is hard to see at this point for a lot of people. So we have, you know, obviously our doctors aren't all bad people. In fact, most of them are very good, well-intentioned people, but they believe the authorities of CDC, the NIH, WHO, Right. They're controlling organizations that control them. And, you know, they're left looking not so trustworthy any longer because of it. So I think I think Matt has a good story here. Why don't you uh, tell that one, Matt? Yeah, I, I, maybe it's a little bit of a funny story, just a personal COVID story. I mean, when COVID first came out, you know, at first I was like, oh, oh, I'm I'm very worried. Maybe I need to get an N95 mask or something, but I couldn't get one of those. And I was like, oh, well, I guess I'll just have to use one of these uh, crappy surgery type masks, you know, just those very basic ones. And when I, when I was at the airport, because I was at the airport like straight away when, when it was supposedly just coming out. And I just looked at the mask and I thought, well, if, if there's supposedly a virus in the air, how is this thing going to stop right. It, it, I mean, it's just going to go, it doesn't even stop air from going into your mouth. So I was immediately like, well, I'm, just like, I'm not even going to wear this. this. This is ridiculous. Um, so that, you know, that realization allowed me to live the entire pandemic with zero fear and zero concern whatsoever. Uh, just as if like there was just all this chaos in the world and pandemic going on for the whole world. Meanwhile, I was just like, uh, whatever, I never got COVID. People will say that's because you have a good immune system or you're just lucky. And, you know, we'll go into some aspects of that 
in a future podcast, but, uh, you know, I wanted to demonstrate some of this to my relatives and, you know, they were having, you know, a, a, a birthday party of my uncle and they were all going, Oh, we've got COVID. We've got COVID, you know, dude, we're wearing masks. We're getting sick. Like no one come near us. And I just wanted to prove to him, like, no, let me show you something. And I went right up to my aunt, just buried my nose in her hair and her face. And I'm like, just give me that COVID. Mm, just give it to me. Just give me all that COVID and didn't get sick. And, you know, just said, see, I didn't get sick. So are you sure that, you know, you, you've believed that if I come near you that I'm going to get sick, right? But I'll just prove to you that I won't, right? So there's just some seeds of uh, some ideas there, but I won't go further into it. Do you want to add anything else, Brad, on on this belief in COVID and anything uh, medical? No, I think we'll, I think like you said, we'll, we'll, we'll treat this as an individual podcast or, or several in the future, but yeah, that's, that was my experience as well, pretty much. Okay. Do you want me to take journalist? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Yeah. The, the, the time has come when if you hear a journalist say something, uh, that you don't put any trust into that whatsoever. Uh, these are people who have come forward and they've said, we are reporting on the truth. You know, we're going and doing all this research and all this, like we're gathering all this experiential data. We're going out into the field. We're learning what's true and we're bringing it to you. And we're telling you, you know, we're saving you all that work, right? So you can rely on us to give you the true stories. And, you know, we all believe this for so, so long. And to, to just watch the media, just, you know, be right in line with, um, with, uh, COVID stories to also be right in line with political stories to just, to just be right in line with just absolutely everything and say all these things that we've seen be proven to not be true. It's like the, the time has come where we don't outsource one single little tiny ounce of our intellect or our research to a journalist, right? Like there may be, you know, journalists who are actually trying to find out the truth and give it to you. But even still, you should still not blindly trust what they say, right? It's, it's just like that phase of humanity is over, okay? Like, like don't, don't do it anymore, okay? Just let it go forever, you know, um, like research everything yourself and don't take anything that a journalist says as true anymore. Do you want to add to that before I go on, Brad? Uh, yeah, I mean, for me, you know, this is this is when it all started to occur to me, you know, ten or fifteen years ago. Is that I, I, I'm not an expert researcher. I'm not a some brilliant journalistic mind. I have no training whatsoever in it. But I find these alternative ideas out in the world, and little by little, I start to notice that the media just never presents these ideas, which, which tended to make me think they were hiding these things, right? Lying by omission, right? Well, there's a counter argument out here that makes a whole lot of sense. Why isn't the media presenting that to us? Aren't they supposed to present us unbiased ideas? Like, even if they say, well, we don't really think this is true, but here's a, here's the thought about what some other people are suggesting that as time has gone on, we see less and less of that. I call it lying by omission, where they simply don't present an idea that does not match up to the collective narrative that they are uh, pitching. So. That was my, my point here. Mm -hmm. So let me just give some ideas as to why uh, what you see presented by journalists might not be true. You have to understand that the journalists, they work for big companies, right? Big media companies. And these big media companies are aligned with, you know, even bigger companies. They're aligned with pharmaceutical companies. They're aligned with... Uh, government organizations, right? And to, you know, for them to, the, the way they operate is to, they present news that is in line with their, the interests of their owners, right? 
So journalists who, you know, go to work there, right? They, they might start off and they're like, you know, they want to, they want to bring the truth, right? But then the company says, oh, no, no, you can't report on that, right? We, we, we have to say these particular things, right? These are at the interests of our outlet, right? The people with integrity, the journalists with integrity, they eventually leave. Anyone who's still at these media corporations after years, you have to assume that there's some sort of selling out going on, that they have lowered their integrity and agreed to report on things that they don't necessarily think is true or don't know is true or don't care is true. And, you know, they're probably receiving a big salary. They're receiving celebrity. You know, they're probably getting to invited to big parties and stuff like that and just a whole bunch of uh, recognition and praise, All right? On the other side of things, you, you, I think it's fairly well known by by now. I, I'm not sure if people are really objecting to this anymore. That the CIA and other intelligence agencies have, you know, inserted journalists into the media corporations. They're like, it's not just people who are selling out and will say anything, but there are journalists deliberately telling you f- false information, right? So. To blindly trust when there's this much suspicion and you know dark energy surrounding uh, these organizations, it's as I said, it's just the the time for that is over. Hundred percent. I think I think just the other day, Matt Taibbi. I'm sure most people are familiar with him. He's been kind of po- pointing out uh, corruption for the last fifteen or twenty years from Rolling Stone. But he uh, sent quite a zinger tweet yesterday or the day before uh, to his colleagues in the media. <laughs> Which was basically that you're corrupt and sellouts. So that that was hard for him to do. I'm sure. I'm sure, he's wanted to say that for a long time, but he came out and said it. So that's going to obviously start a firestorm out there. Mm-hmm. Well, why don't you take on uh, the law, Brad? Absolutely. And just a my little quick note, last note about that is that you know when it comes to matters that are very important to you in your life. Uh, the best advice we can give you is to become your own journalist and look into things for yourself, look in places that aren't authoritative, you know, establishment sources, look outside of those, see the, uh, you know, opposing arguments, as we mentioned in the previous podcast about, you know, understanding what the other people are saying and come to your own conclusions rather than the establishment majority has it right. Uh, I'm going to zip through lawyer here just to say that I think a lot of people, you know, lawyers generally have a bad name and, you know, get a lot of jokes pointed their way. Uh, you know, I think people tend to believe rightfully so that they overcharge. And in some cases, you know, they're more focused on winning than actual justice. Uh, you know, there's this idea that there's, you know, some attorneys, you know, especially in big cities, you know, of course, New York and Washington, D.C., especially uh, charge just outrageous fees. I mean, you wouldn't, the average person couldn't even come close to paying their retainers, let alone their hourly fees. But, you know, the advantage of paying those outrageous fees is these attorneys get the results that their that their clients looking for somehow. Right. Something that a lower fee, lower charge attorney couldn't do for them. So you got to start asking questions like, are these just the most brilliant attorneys that understand the every last intricacy of the legal code or is something else going on in these situations? So food for thought. Uh, this the last comment I'll make about this is, you know, all of our attorneys believe that they got, they were taught the law. And it's my contention that we'll talk about in future podcasts that they were actually taught something called the legal system. They were taught legal procedure, which is not the law at its base. And it's a hard thing for attorneys to hear. And they, of course, violently disagree. And, you know, it's a, it's a complicated discussion to have uh, because attorneys are necessary for corporate entities, fictional entities, as we call them. Uh, but when it comes to matters between men and women exclusively, uh, they were not taught what I believe and many others believe is lawful procedure, uh, very different from legal procedure. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, any uh added comments or uh, questions from you, Matt? Could you just maybe just say like 20 or 30 seconds on this idea of just the legal system being overlaid, overlaid on the natural law? Yeah, that, what they, it, the short version of that is, is that they have converted 
men and women into artificial entities and so that so that they can now operate in commerce or commercial warfare or uniform commercial code so they had to transform a man or a woman into a, a non-living fictional entity and then they were able, now they're able to proceed with men and women not knowing this of course but then the legal system works so right the lawful system doesn't work for corporations they're artificial entities they don't have natural rights right they don't have what a man and a woman have so the legal system is required for an artificial entity they define all these artificial entities and what what their rights and so forth are but in order to handle the day-to-day -day affairs of men and women or for the state to prosecute a man or woman right in the in the real world dead entities fictional entities and real entities cannot interact they're in two different worlds if that makes sense does that is that am i saying this right so you understand that well i mean it definitely needs to be said in a whole hour but yeah. i think that's a, just a good uh just introduction to just you know wet someone's appetite and uh you know right. just check in later when the this uh full podcast this, this is the uh, straw is man out. or the all capitals name idea that a lot of people have heard right they don't understand it fully some do but it's that's the that's the effect if you look at all your licenses and passports and legal documents and bank accounts there's this all capitals name your name which none of us were taught <laughs> to write our name that way in grammar school were we in elementary school we were taught to capitalize the first letter of our, all our names and not the rest but in the legal system it's all capitalized and this is the artificial entity that they have right. created yeah, so just take a look at all your documents and just look at that all capitals name and think, hey, who is that? What is that? Right. But uh, let's just leave it there, I'd say. Very good. So we want to go into uh, the cause of this. Like, how did we end up in a situation where we outsource our intellectual integrity, uh, let other people do our thinking for us, uh, blindly trust an authority, right? So this is this is one of the major topics of research and consideration. Like, I don't think there's a single week that's gone by when we haven't discussed, like, why is it that people do this? <laughs> um, I guess that's one of the main things we are uh, bonded over uh, in the beginning. That uh, we, as young as I, uh, as far back as I can remember, to my youth, I always felt like I was like. Uh, I was like, why are people all saying this stuff that doesn't seem like they're actually thought about it, but it seems like they just listen to someone else say it and now they're saying it to me. I always had this feeling. And then when I met Brad, it kind of seemed like he had that feeling as well. So this topic is a topic of philosophy. It's a branch of philosophy. It's called epistemology. Epistemology is basically the study of knowledge, study of how things can be known. And it's just like, if you study epistemology, you're thinking like, how do I know stuff? Like, how do I think? How do I know things? How do I figure out what's true, right? And there are essentially uh, fundamental flaws in the collective way that people are using logic, right, to know the truth, right? Uh, it's it's as if we we once had it, like we once knew how to do it, but it's kind of just vanished. It's as if we just forgot how to know the truth, right? Because it's not, um, it's not uh, at this point. It's not really automatic anymore. Just just knowing exactly how to perfectly use logic, we kind of like need to be taught almost, or we almost need to like dedicate years of our life to like just figuring out like how do I know things objectively, right? Like this is a bit of an art to it. Um, but you know, if it takes so much time, you know, we've we've instead gone into this other system where we're like, well, I'll I'll think objectively about my particular area. And then I'll just, you know, let other people think about their areas and I'll just trust them to tell me. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. But there, there is a, uh, there's, there's other things to it. Right. So I want to introduce this, uh, this, uh, concept, uh, it's a concept called evasion. Right. Uh, and this is, a something that's explored and detailed by Ayn Rand, uh, one of my favorite philosophers and she basically int introduced this thing that we do in our minds to avoid our fears, right? To evade our fears, right? So we have fears and negative emotions kind of like in our body, in our, in our soul, in our mind, right? Somewhere in there. 
and we're not like it and we evade that and this sends us toward a flawed system of logic because when you you lo- when you use logic you find out the truth and you know as jack nicholson said so famously you can't handle the truth all right because the truth implies sometimes negative emotions and you know painful ideas that we can't deal with right so we do this thing called evasion so i want to read the paragraph from Ayn Rand that just uh really elucidates this concept okay here it is thinking is man's only basic virtue from which all the others proceed and his basic vice the source of all his evils is that nameless act which all of you practice but struggle never to admit the act of blanking out the willful suspension of one's consciousness the refusal to think not blindness but the refusal to see not ignorance but the refusal to know it is the act of unfocusing your mind and inducing an inner fog to escape or evade the responsibility of judgment or discernment i think is better stated on the unstated premise that a thing will not exist if only you refuse to identify it that a will not be a so long as you do not pronounce the verdict it is okay mm. so there are wow. all these truths out there the truth that we are evading because it's like just uh, uh, no no that can't be true i don't want it to be true right I, I i just refuse to even think about it i won't look at it no because that would imply things that i don't want to know okay pretty heavy stuff there brad right super heavy it's a powerful powerful statement and uh, you know, i'm just going to add a little thing in here we didn't, we didn't outline it but this will be future podcast material but th- this idea this word no if you look back at what we'll call ancient documents, texts, you can find it in the Bible, you can find it in Greek, Latin. This word has been translated, mistranslated, uh, changed around to essentially sell us on the idea that knowing is an, an intellectual act, mm-hmm. where it, wherein uh, this word know, to know in a lot of these older ancient documents is actually to experience. It's what it really means. Right. It's, it's like my example of the orange, right. I, that I give all the time, right. You say you're a PhD, uh, you're going to write a PhD dissertation on, on the taste of an orange and you've never actually tasted one, but you go and study all the chemical compounds and the molecules and the flavors, and you can write a hundred page dissertation on the flavor of an orange. And so you become the world's greatest expert on quote unquote, knowing what an orange tastes like, but you've never tasted one before. So does that PhD expert really know what an orange tastes like because they can talk about it for four hours and and you know know every last little detail about why an orange tastes the way it tastes, or do they have no idea? Do they not know what an orange tastes like because they never tasted it? That's the essential mm-hmm. idea. It's just the word right. knowing. But the, I mean the and, yeah, the Rand quote. Go ahead, that, right? That's incredible. I think that's she's saying it. She's pointing out. Uh, what every all of us can agree with, even though we still refuse to look into these things that uh, are uncomfortable. I think that's right. what she's saying, right? Oh yeah, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll mention a few uh, things that are to do with what that discomfort is. But I just want to touch on that idea that you put forward, Brad, of knowing. Uh, you know, people think if they kind of like go read a book by Einstein and uh, you know read uh, watch watch a bunch of PBS Space Time on YouTube and listen to Neil deGrasse Tyson talk with Joe Rogan about like astronomy, that they kind of like know these things, right? They're like, oh yes, I know, right? Dark matter, yeah, okay. Uh, Black holes, I read Stephen Hawking's book, Black Holes, yeah, galaxies, 4 trillion, whatever, (laughs) 13.7 billion years ago, Big Bang. People think that they actually know that like this is the description of the universe oh yeah quantum mechanics electrons right the Planck length all right all sorts of stuff like this and just yeah you know, I'm, I'm no stranger to the mathematics here right but like people think they actually know this stuff without any um experiential you know without any experience whatsoever people go around and just talk about their knowledge of what is true of the structure of the universe at a macroscopic and microscopic level 
and this is just absurd. <laughs> okay. Uh, so l- let me introduce like just some reasons why people do this evasion thing, right? And work them into this, uh, work themselves into this situation where they're literally afraid to look at the truth and therefore just have to continue on ble- believing um, uh, what experts say or something or what authorities say, right? Um, here, th- these are pretty heavy, by the way. So get ready. Uh, lacking the courage to face reality. Okay metaphysical worthlessness okay when i'm in nathaniel brandon's book on self-esteem he talks about how when people realize that they didn't think and didn't experience to gain their knowledge and that they just let someone else tell them what was true it creates a feeling inside them of metaphysical worthlessness so when you push someone toward facing the fact that they outsource their thinking they're having a, an encroaching feeling of metaphysical worthlessness, right? So they have to push that away, right? So until they gain the courage to face that, they have to literally just just pretend that everything's fine and that they really know what they know, okay? And that metaphysical worthlessness is also this feeling of cognitive dissonance. It's like the, the feeling like the head's going to explode. Like, oh, no, it can't be. It can't possibly be true, All right? Fear of independent thinking, fear of independence, fear of reality, and yeah, I mean, the, those are the big high level things that uh, people are afraid of uh, and the reason why they evade and uh, maintain a state of, um, uh, you know, epistemology where they outsource their intellectual integrity. Perfect. Right. And at the core, <clears throat> excuse me, I had a sip of coffee there and went down the wrong tube. At the core of this is really the fear of taking back one's own personal power. Mm-hmm. So that's the essence of all of this. Taking one, taking back one's authority frightens people that have outsourced it for so long. Makes yeah. sense? Yeah. I mean, to, to, you know, we've been talking that this podcast is a bridge to self discovery. And we, we tell people, you know, if you do this self discovery, you are going to end up at a place of extreme empowerment. But to acknowledge that such empowerment exists requires you to acknowledge that for some reason you don't have it and that why don't you have it? You know, it brings up that question, well, why don't you have it? Right. So that's a, that's a tough thing for people to, you know, hone in on and uh, explore. It's taking back responsibility, Mm -hmm. which can be very fear inducing. So we, we've kind of talked about, um, you know, the cause of this situation from the perspective of like, where have we uh, personally failed? Or where have we let our guard down and allowed ourselves to, you know, act like this? But it's not just us, right? It kind of like, like takes two to tango, right? So we should also look at the, the leaders here, right? And probably we should, we should look at it in a perspective of like, what is this relationship that's been established between followers and leaders? Like what's going on with the follower mindset and what's going on with the leader mindset? Mm-hmm. Do you want to take that away, Brett? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, everybody I think's heard this idea of herd mentality and it's quite, it's a, it's a natural thing that uh, humans gravitate toward. And it makes sense, right? It's, if you look back at history, uh, obviously people that were able to survive attacks or harsh conditions and so forth were better prepared to do that. They were part of a, you know, a group or a tribe. So there is a natural tendency to want to fit into a group. And in fact, <clears throat> Maslow's hierarchy suggests exactly this. Once we uh, meet our needs of, you know, food, water, safety, and shelter, the next thing we look for is group acceptance. So it is a very natural thing for us to do. Uh, and, Certainly, no, nothing wrong with that uh, in any in any state. But there comes a time when, if the herd is uh, heading in the wrong direction, it takes that person who can arrive at their own conclusions and not blindly trust authority to um, come to the proper conclusions, so as to avoid the pitfalls that sometimes this herd mentality actually uh, presents. So the you know it's the safety in numbers idea, the group si- survival dynamic. So all powerful, all understandable. But there comes a time when you have to be able to 
step up with your, with your own, <clears throat> excuse me, research, with your own intu intuitive feeling about something and be willing to step away from the herd or to challenge the herd when you know it's right. And it's a, it's a difficult thing uh, for a lot of people, but we're suggesting in all that we present in this podcast that this is something that we're all going to have to do moving forward more and more. That's the way that the collective humanity is heading. So any, uh, any additional comments on that, Matt? I, I would only comment that uh, there's a fear that each individual needs to go through uh, when claiming back their power here and their own intellectual sovereignty and integrity. And that is that when all the people around you are blindly trusting in authority and you realize that they're saying that a particular thing is true, but you're getting the, the feeling like, you know what, I don't think that's true. You And, and you, you consider um, separating from that particular group. You get the, You have to go through the fear of being apart from that group right and standing alone so these are the kind of barriers that we're up against so right. when 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 you the listener you know when when you start to you know question things more and more and more just just be always ready and be courageous to go through the fear everything's going to be fine you only have to go through it and then as soon as you go through it you're fine but just be ready that's right. The fear is always about a, a future, which is always potential, but never real. <laughs> mm -hmm. Just a little side note there, right? But yeah, you're absolutely right. It is scary for people who choose to do that for the first time. No question. All right, Brad, how about you kick us into the leaders here? That's what I thought we were. I was introducing us to a second ago. I probably did it a bit incorrectly, but uh, how about you tell us how leaders are enforcing this situation that we're in well yeah so this is you know obviously we'll have to dedicate future podcasts to this idea but you know it's it's certainly our contention that we have some leaders in place that are deliberately deliberately deceiving us it's not accidental uh there's a lot of reasons for that uh and while most people want to twist that negative it is in a sense but it's also a positive in a sense again it's a big idea uh, we'll talk about that later, but there's just no question about this. And uh, I think more and more people are seeing it, especially with, you know, the COVID situation that's happened the last three years. Um, but obviously the people around us, society, culture at large, will quickly put us in our place when we try to break out of these leader-based uh, herd mentality, you know, follow the rules type of you know, psychology that we're constantly being, it's, it's 24 by seven coming at us. So it's not just the leaders, but it's also the followers that form a group like their leaders and put that pressure on us. So it's a big part of this. And, <clears throat> you know, something we'll talk about quite a bit is TV programming. And a lot of people agree that there's, you know, violence and sex and bad ideas and behaviors and so forth that, that people don't always agree with, but they keep watching. And, and I think at a deeper level, what's really happening and we'll, we'll do a, you know, longer podcast on this is that our behavior is being shaped by what we watch and we're taking in what's acceptable, what's normal, what's okay at, from our television sets. And then we're acting those behaviors out unconsciously. And that takes take society in a certain direction. And it's very slow, happens very methodically over years and decades, but it, over time it shifts the mentality of the herd towards where the people who are producing this programming want us to go. Uh, so big idea there. Uh, what was the last one there, Matt? Uh, oh, threat of violence, imprisonment. Can I, can I mention TV programming? Uh, Please. Just a bit of the stuff that what you've mentioned before. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, like the the programming is in a way that you don't expect, right? It's not it's not so much that they're programming you to do such obvious things as like as you think, right? It's so much more subtle. So let me give you an example, right? Like, uh, you know, I, I like that show Friends. It's it's kind of funny, right? I've I've watched that all my life. Uh, 
but you know it's a tv show about six people who's you know hang around in an apartment and uh, talk to each other and go to their jobs and wear normal clothes and think normal things right it's not a show about six people who talk about how wonderful it is to be empowered and how they don't blindly trust in authority and you know manifest amazing creation all around them and you know live wildly successful lives and help a bunch of people right it's not about that okay it's just about just being regular it's about being in an apartment and working a job and paying taxes and going to the doctor and seeing a lawyer and going to a football game right so tv programs you to to tell you what's normal okay oh yeah that, like that right yeah just like well, I'll, I'll, I'll go get an apartment and I'll live in it yeah and just hang out with friends and do stuff right and while i'm not saying that's completely wrong it's just that the the reality that they're trying to present to you is completely devoid of any self-discovery whatsoever and devoid of any questioning or of authority in the slightest right so it's what they present as normal is the core of the deception would you agree with that brad is you're, you're the one who introduced me to that idea so maybe you can add to it you got it right you got it absolutely right and you, know, you can hear people you know quoting from these tv shows and doing the things that they do and so forth right so you see it mimicked around you if you're paying attention and over time these things become normal so to speak right they get normalized so it's a very subtle form of what i call behavior shaping mm -hmm. and again it just takes you know, happens over a long period of time you can't say oh this one show is where it happened right that was the whole series all 10 seasons and you know 30 shows a season whatever so that you know whatever however many there were right 300 shows were selling right. uh, a type of behavior type of action uh that right. deeply embedded into the consciousness because so many people watched it so right or if, if you watch like the west wing or if you watch some show about you know the, the legal system you're like <laughs> yeah that's it right? The, right that's it yeah or if you watch like a a show about the FBI, they're like, oh yeah, the FBI, they're like looking out for us, right? They're solving all the crimes, right? It's absurd. You're dating yourself. All these shows are like 20 years old. <laughs> Sorry, I just chuckled. Like, Law and Order, right? <laughs> Isn't that what people watch? That one's, yeah, that one's been running for like 50 years for all I know, long time, 30 years. Anyway, let's dive into the last section here with because we want to just that threat people. of violence, I think, is worth mentioning. Oh, okay, yeah, go ahead. Oh, sure. Yeah, I mean, like the at the at the very top of the the control here, it's like blind. It's like trust in us, do what we say, or you're going to get in trouble, right? Like you're going to trust us that taxes are correct, and you're going to pay them. You're going to go to prison, right? <laughs> like. Uh, you're going to act how we're telling you you are supposed to act or there are threats of violence or imprisonment. This is coercion, okay? So this is this is serious. Right. This is not just us, us making a mistake. This is uh, two people playing at a game here. You'll notice a thread that's just more fear inducement. Induce the fear, that gets you the result of compliance. Mm-hmm. All right, you want to lead into it, Brett? Uh, second five, yeah. So, well, this is our this is our last little section. Um, coming up on an hour here, we'll try to keep it tight. So, you know, the biggest impediment that I think we have, just repeating what I said at the top, was this blind trust and authority. The more people who break away from this, the less power the authorities, perceived power the authorities will have over us. So it's worth mentioning a call to action, which is I'm, I'm suggesting that everybody listening you know, picks a personal topic. Maybe some of you have already done this and you're well on your way. But for those that haven't, you know, there's everybody has something that they have nagging suspicions about. They're not quite sure. Is this, did we really get told the truth about this, that, or the other? 
Uh, so, you know, it just could be a small personal thing that's going on or maybe a big issue like some of the ones we've brought up. But my suggestion, of course, is that we look outside of the authoritative sources, right? the mainstream sources for our answers. Seek out that, you know, one out of, of the 10 experts that disagree with the decision and just dive into it. Look around. You can do a lot of searches. Obviously, we recommend uh, some non-standard search engines, uh, some non-standard video platforms, so forth, to sniff around, ask questions, and you'll be led down some interesting paths. So there may be a little discomfort there, but I think you'll have your intuition uh, verified if you do enough of this and just aren't willing to stop at the first official authoritative source that says, this is the truth, these are the answers, uh, and dig a little bit deeper, see what the uh, alternative explanations are that you're investigating. Mm -hmm. So personal journey, None, you don't have to pick any of the topics we talked about today, pick your own. Like I said, every, I think everybody has this nagging suspicion about at least one thing. They're not, they're not so sure it's true. So that's that's my call to action for folks today. Sure, and just a word of encouragement, uh, or just a word to give you courage, which I guess is a word of encouragement, right? It's right. Uh, like uh, in what they said in the X-Files, right? Like, the truth is out there. Right? <laughs> exactly. Like, it, it's out there. Like, if you have a thing that you want to know the truth about, it is out there. It's all a just, just get the courage to just go and look at it. Right. right. You can't hide the truth, right? You can try to paint over it. Right, try to keep it away from your mainstream authoritative sources, but it's never hidden. It's always out there. One hundred percent. So this is what our podcasts and courses are about, by the way. Like they're always a specific topic and we'll always be presenting like here's what the mainstream narrative is, right? And then we'll be poking holes in it and saying, Well, what about this contradiction? It doesn't make sense, does it? And we'll be providing just different ways to think about it and Presenting you uh, suggestions for what could possibly tr be true and asking you to consider them and see if you think they are. Beautiful. Right. This is a great bullet here. I was going to give it to you here, but you want to take that next one? I love it. Uh, you mean get out of the mindset? Yeah. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, I mean, like, get out of the mindset of being told things, right? Like... That's so 12 years old, right? <laughs> like you go to school and the teacher tells you what's what. Like, I, I imagine almost everyone listening to it is now is a, an adult, right? So adults are not told things, right? Men and women are not told things by other adults, okay? Like, you know, like that, that, that is a low self-esteem position, right? So just summon up every bit of self-esteem that you can possibly connect to and just tell yourself, you know, you're an adult and you don't need to be told things, not even by me, not even by Brad. We're not here to tell you things. We respect you. We, we treat you as king and kings and queens. We're not here to tell you anything. We just say what we think and it's you. It's up to you. You, you think about it. 100%. So we ask everybody, you know, when are you going to start questioning everything that's important? This is this is the big step that we all need to take, right? Are there some risks? Possibly. Um, you know, is 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 breaking down beliefs going to be difficult for some people on some topics? Quite likely. Certainly going to be perceived that way. Um, but this is the step we all need to take to break this control matrix of authorities and followers. It's when we stop being the followers. That's when it breaks. It doesn't break when we end the Fed or we, you know, fix the media or whatever the source of the problems some people may perceive. We need to do it individually, one by one. Uh, and, you know, this was my final thought is just that I say you, each one of you is the authority over your life. You know, if you're a parent with kids, then you're the authority over your kids until they turn 18. Yeah, yeah. But really, each of us is independent, sovereign authority in our own lives. And the more we begin to think like that, the less we take the word of people trying to be the authorities over us. 
So you can take back your authority on health, on law, on governing, on journalism, and doing your own research. And it's, it's, it's so empowering and it's so liberating that when you start down this path, you'll wonder why you, you, you hadn't done this already in your life. It's that powerful. And that's what, certainly what we hope to, uh, to do in all our future podcasts is get everybody back to full empowerment and liberation. Any, mm -hmm. uh, any other thoughts there, Matt? Uh, not on that. Can I, can I mention the, uh, take your power back based on that? Please. Right. So, you know, everything we're pointing to here is like moving away from blind trust in authority and toward independent thinking and just empowered state of being where you're this sovereign king or queen, uh, right. Living in this way. And this course that we've made, take your power back is, something that guides you step by step on not just you know uh throwing around intellectual concepts in your head like we've done on this podcast but fully integrating uh all these ideas literally into your being right physically emotionally mentally so that you actually become over a period of you know six to nine months of conscious study and dedication you actually become an empowered person like you literally make a transformation and just become the ultimate version of yourself like i think that's pretty well said brad do you want to do you want to add anything yeah to it? yeah that was that was very well said i'll just say that it's it goes back to my orange analogy i gave earlier right it's it's a process of experiencing and being your empowered self it's not a new strain of thoughts floating around in your head I'm now empowered because I think so. It's this, mm -hmm. it's a, call it a lifestyle. You actually feel, sense, and experience the empowerment through taking this course. That's the beauty of it. It's not more thoughts and concepts and abstractions in the head. Make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. It is a real thing. You're really going to reconnect with your authentic, powerful self. If I can add two more courses, we have two other awesome courses. We have this conscious eating course. So cool. It's the conscious eating, the key to losing weight. Like, you know, if you're, if you have weight struggles, like what 50% of people in the world, uh, and you've been doing all these like physical things like dieting and suppressing cravings and, you know, all this stuff that the, they, they all tell you to do and workout plans and stuff, right? We, we've got this incredible uh, alternate perspective, right? So just uh, look look on the site and we've got this introductory video that tells you a whole new perspective on losing weight, okay? It's, it's incredible. Uh, that's all I need to say. Just look at the video. It's incredible. Really? Back pain miracle, that's my classic one on solving back pain and other things like fibromyalgia, neuropathy, you know, and anything where you've got pain in your body, that's the best thing on the planet for fixing that. Brad? Big course. Yeah, I think that's it. I think we got a wrap here. Uh, hopefully we conveyed this idea, this platitude into a, a real tangible thing that people can wrap their heads around. And uh, like I said, we'll be doing, this is what will you know, be the uh, nature and substance of all we do in the future with the specific topics that we go through. I just wanted to get this out of the way and say, stop treating this idea like it's a platitude and integrate it into the way you live life and accept truths and so-called truths from the authorities. That's my final Beautiful. Thought. Love it. All right. Well, that's a wrap then, huh? Yep. Okay. Well, thanks so much for listening, everyone. And thank you, Brad, for joining me today. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, everybody. And we'll be back next week with uh, another topic to go over. We hope everybody enjoyed this today. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.